My friends, I'm on a hiatus from working on musical instruments right now, and that started just this past Tuesday. Well, guess what happened on Tuesday evening? One of my close friends brought me this to work on. <laughs> and even though I'm not working on musical instruments now, as you might expect, my close friends get a pass. I'll tell you all about what this thing needs right after this. Hello my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. And even when I make a plan and try to execute it, it just seems to always fail. <laughs> Such are the best laid plans of mice and men. You know, as I always say, it's not easy being me. Are you starting to understand why? <laughs> this is a nice Martin. It says Martin uh, HD28V. I'm not quite sure what the V stands for right off the top of my head, but it is a nice Martin guitar. So what does it need? Well, it needs a bridge removal and replacement. Can you see that the bridge is pulling up back here? It's pretty loose, but let's just turn the camera down here and let's see if we can tell how loose it is. My standard test for checking how loose a bridge is is the paper test, and I have not done this yet. I just took this out of the case a moment ago, so I don't even know how bad it is. It looks worse than it's showing here. This, the, well, it's going under there a good bit. It's going under there more than an eighth of an inch in places. Like right there, it's going in nearly a quarter inch. So the point is, once they start coming loose, you're better off to just get the bridge off there and, and clean it all and put it back on. He's taken this to two other shops already, and one of them didn't want to touch it, and the other one said he could fix it. But then after a week or so, he they got back together and said, "No, nah, come pick it up. I don't want to. I don't want to fix it." So it's up to me to do something with this, and I, I'm sure we can fix it. You know, it really does look worse to me than it measures with this, and I'm I'm just wondering if there's not something in the way that's keeping me from going in there because it it definitely looks like a pretty big gap right there is. You know, a little over an eighth of an inch is all I'm really getting the penetration, but just looking at it, the gap is pretty big. So I know it definitely needs that. Before we take this off, I'm going to tune up at least a couple strings, and it may already be in tune. It's actually pretty close to in tune. I'm going to just tune up the two E strings and see what the intonation's like. It's almost 10 cents sharp. Wait a minute. Let's try it again. I'll let you see the, the needle there as I uh, hit the bass E string. You can see it's pretty close to center. When I note it, it's about almost 10 cents sharp. not too bad on that one. It's pretty sharp on the E string. That could have something to do with the fact that the bridge is tilted forward a little bit. I, I just wanted to check it because if it's really off a lot, we probably should fix that too when we take the bridge off. It's close enough. I think we can live with it, and I think I can maybe push this back some to uh, lengthen that to help with the intonation. The bridge itself doesn't look like it's broken, so I don't think it needs to be replaced. All we just need to do is you know, take this apart, clean the areas, put them back together, and then we should be good to go. The uh, top does not look like it's pulled up anywhere, so I think it's everything looks like it should be very uh, sound. It's just that the bridge is coming loose. More than likely, it's glued to the finish. One of the problems with a uh, guitar like this is this, this long saddle, I mean, it's good and bad. It's good in the sense that it spreads the sound out really a long way. 
It's bad in the sense that these are typically glued in and therefore I, it's in my way. You know, like when I put my heater on here, it's in the way. When I put the clamps on here, it's in the way. And, you know, I tried to check to see is it, is it loose enough to pull out of there, but doesn't seem like it. When I heat it up, it might get loose and get out of my way, and that would be kind of nice. But uh, honestly, I, I don't like these long saddles for that reason. If, if they weren't glued in, I'd be fine with them. Before I take this off, I'm going to go ahead and score the finish all the way around. And the reason I'm doing that is because if this is glued to the finish, and I believe it is, then it would be less likely to tear up and pull the finish off in the in any place where it is still stuck. So, and, you know, I need to take all the finish off in this footprint anyway. So it makes sense to just go ahead and score it ahead of time. And since we know we're gonna put the bridge back in the same place because the intonation's pretty close, it just makes sense. Now, if I thought I had to move the bridge quite a bit, I wouldn't do this. I think that's gonna be it. So let's just go ahead and get the heater set up on here. I have my homemade bridge heater right here and I have it set to 420 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm going to go ahead and place it on here and probably have to hold it by hand. Typically I turn it the other way around, but because of that saddle in the way, I'm, I get more contact on this side. So I'm just letting it uh, lay like that. I guess I could turn it this way. Either way, it doesn't really make too much difference, but I have to get as much contact as I can. And I think I'll just lay this piece of <coughs> wood under here. Maybe we'll get lucky and maybe the saddle will get loose and get out of my way. That would be nice. You can see we're not very hot yet. We're only at 111, uh, well, 13. It's moving pretty fast. It's going up pretty fast, but we got a long way to get to uh, 400. While this is heating up, I thought I'd take a look on the inside and see if I see anything. I don't expect to see any problems because everything looks good from the outside. It's got a maple bridge pad, which at least it's better than a plywood bridge pad. I don't think maple is your best option there for a bridge pad because it's not the best for sound transfer. But we're not going to take it out of there because there's no damage to it and it looks fine. It's in perfect condition. If it were chewed up or broken or something, we would take it out and replace it with a better hardwood that would transfer sound even better. If you're new to bridge removal, and I suspect you might be, this uh, tool here is like an artist's palette knife. It's got a fairly stiff blade, yet it has got some flex to it. And I have got it shaped so that it will go under here fairly easily. You know, there's a little bit of an angle to this. And I also have cleaned this blade off a lot. You know, like every time you do this, because it's hot, the glue will stick to these blades. So you want these blades as slick and, and shiny as possible when you start removing a bridge. Well, we're up at temperature, so we'll get started here very sh shortly. One of my tests is to reach inside and feel if you can feel any warmth. I can just barely feel warmth coming through on the bridge pad. So we know we're at least getting into the top there a little bit, but it's not real warm yet. I'm heating up the knife so that it will cut the glue really easily as it goes in. Let's give it our first shot and see what it's like. It needs to be pretty hot for that to go to, to cut that glue. It's, it's working, but we're going to give it some more heat and some more time. Okay, I've let it set there a few more minutes, and I'm going to now try to heat up the ends also. Okay. 
heat up the knife a little bit and see if we can get it under there. It seems like it's going to go. The glue balls up on these things, so I often heat these up, uh, you know, separate and then wipe the glue off. It's working, but it's slow. So we've got more work to do. You can see the glue has got on the end of the uh, knife there. So I'm going to heat this up and wipe the glue back off because that glue really makes it hard to stick it back in there. It, it grabs and it really makes it difficult. So I'll wipe the glue off. Ouch! Pretty hot. You got to be very careful. I thought I had enough thickness there, but I didn't. This is not coming off easy, that's for sure. I can tell you 420 degrees is pretty warm. I burnt my thumb pretty good on that. And that was just on the knife that's not nearly as hot as the iron itself. See if we can get any progress here on this end, because this end isn't working very good. We're making progress, but it's it's slow progress. I guess I'm going to have to try to heat the front of this too, because it's not coming loose toward the front at all. Lay this paper there just to kind of be a little bit of a heat shield so that the heat doesn't just hit the varnish directly there as I'm hovering above it. It's almost harder to get it out once you get it in there than it is to get it in there because the glue sticks to it and it's really hard to pull it back out. We're getting there, but boy, it's a slow process on this one. Once again, this is a very destructive process. There's, you know, there's just no easy way to do this. And that's why most shops turn it away when they have the option to do one of these. They say, nope, no thank you, because they know how difficult this is. It really is just about as hard to pull it back out as it is to push it in there. I wonder if this will come out now. If this has gotten hot enough. Yep, I think it will. I'm going to take that out. That'll help me a lot. Yep, that's coming out. That's, that's a big help for me. Oh, it's broken. It's broken. Well, I think it's plastic anyway. We'll, uh, we'll replace that with a piece of bone antler. I don't know. It may be bone, but I don't think I broke that, honestly. I don't think I did. I think that was already cracked, maybe. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We'll replace it with a piece of antler, which is just as good or better maybe better all right that's makes it a lot better i can get the heat on there better and i can get the heat on the front edge better and the front edge is really that's all that's holding it at this point well with any luck maybe we'll get it this time I can tell you for sure this one doesn't want to come up. I don't know why. I hesitate to go to the front. I hate to I hate to take them stick the knife in from the front. You can usually see the problem when you do that. There it went. 
And yes, it was glued to the finish around here. And yeah, it did pull out a little bit, but not very bad. We might see if we can get that off in one piece and put it back. But overall, that came off pretty good. You know, if you just get them off uh, in almost any form, it's better than the way they are. But you can see that they had uh, the finish in this far all the way around. And that's not a good thing. We'll, we'll not have any finish when we glue it back on. And that'll give you, the, you, just think of all the surface area that is that can be glued now. And how much extra strength that provides. Well, that's about all I'm going to do on it for today. That gets me at least... Uh, past the hard part and uh, that that's the hardest part right there once you get the bridge off well the rest of it's fairly straightforward I probably should have showed how I peeled this off here but I didn't um, I peeled it off with a single edge uh, razor blade I just started in up here and started working it back and I got 90% of it so that's good enough we're going to uh, put that back in place right here and it fits right in there just really well. I didn't get that little tiny piece there, that's okay. But it's it's working really good. I think we can make that work. That'll f fill in the biggest part of it. And it wasn't bad anyway. You could probably get by without filling it in. But if you can, you might as well. So I'm doing that. that in place and now I'm just wiping off the extra glue and I'll probably use some sort of a piece of plastic to lay over the top of that and then a little block of wood or something on top of that to keep it clamped in place and then I'll put a put a guitar clamp in here and just kind of hold it there until it sets up. I thought that was going to work, but now it's, I really thought I had a brace there that I could clamp on. It feels like it's there, but it doesn't, when I start clamping it, it rolls around. I don't know why that's not working. That should work, I would think. All right, well instead of that, I'll just find something heavy to sit on there, like this bottle of glue that's full, and that'll keep it... It doesn't need much, it's just a little bit is all it needs just to keep it flat until the glue sets. So we'll just go with that. While the uh, glue is sitting up on that little piece that I cut off here, I'm just going to go ahead and scrape the rest of this bridge and get it cleaned up. I've got a toothed blade here that I'm using as a scraper. Well, that's working, but it's not working that great. So I'm going to go to the exacto blade here with the round end, and I think that'll do better. There's finish stuck to this on the edges where the finish, where this was overlapping the edge. So I gotta get all that off too. If you do a good job scraping, you don't really have much to sand. I typically do sand them just to make sure the fibers of the wood are kinda, you know, roughed up a little bit. The sandpaper kinda helps with that and then it gives you a real good glue surface. But anyway, uh, this is scraping it off. It's, it's coming off. There's, that glue that they used was a good glue. I imagine it was uh, some form of like a tight bond or something like that, some, some wood glue. It held a little better than some of them, but it still came off as you, as you can see, and, it, and the glue did melt, and it did come off.
definitely want to all that varnish off that was on the edges because you really haven't gained anything if you don't get it back down to bare wood. Makes me wish you were near. I tried to stop thinking of you. But every little thing I do makes me wish and dream of you. I'm blue all over again. I will say there was quite a bit of stuff on this. The glue and the varnish both were really stuck to this. I think that's got 99% of it. A little bit there I see on the end right there. Still. That looks pretty good. I'll do, I'll do a little bit of sanding now just to uh, make sure that it's all off. And the sanding will also show me where, there, where there's still more uh, glue and finish on there, if there is any, because it'll be a little different color. That looks pretty good. There might still be just a little bit right here. I really don't want any of that finish or varnish or, or glue, either any of those. I just don't want any of that in the way. I think that did it. Okay, I think that's good. You know, we'll have to clean off the bridge area there after we uh, have that glue dry, and we'll get back to that probably tomorrow. I spent a little more time off camera cleaning that up a little bit more and then I used some rough sandpaper on this to just break the shine on that and I think we're ready to go as good as we're gonna get I think so let's go ahead and get the glue on here that's probably more than we'll need I try to spread it around and not get it down in the holes any more than I have to, but it doesn't really hurt too much if it gets in the holes a little bit. It's just that it can glue it to your call if you're not careful. Got a little more glue on there than I needed, so I'm going to put it on here, the extra glue. Okay, we've got real good coverage there, so now we'll get the bridge in place. And just for grins, I'm going to put these pins in there just to kind of make sure that the bridge is in the right place. I'm getting the glue out of the holes with these pins, kind of. I'm putting a fresh coat of wax on this call and that way when I put it in there the, the glue shouldn't stick to it in case there is glue squeeze out. I don't think there'll be enough glue squeeze out to matter but better safe than sorry. When you're clamping something like this up, uh, you've got to be very careful. If you have these wings down ahead of time, you can force a bow into this and you don't want to do that. So I've only got the center clamped at the moment. These are up floating and I like to keep it that way for a while and then put the next clamp on.
each clamp squeezes out more glue so I've got more glue cleanup yet and yeah it's a little awkward with all these clamps and yeah there are other clamps out there but I prefer this method for a couple of reasons number one you're getting a lot of pressure on this and I like to squeeze as much glue out as possible even though some people will think you're squeezing all the glue out that never happens Second, this keeps it flat. I like this method better for keeping it flat versus some of the other clamps can pull a curve into the top if you're not careful. The more you squeeze it, the more glue comes out and I'm okay with that. Now I'll start tightening these wings down a little bit. I don't need to tighten them down a lot, but you can see when I did, glue started squeezing out. That's why you need all these clamps. It's, you'd be surprised how difficult it is to clamp two flat things together. They like to slide around. They don't like to squeeze the glue out because there's so much surface area. But when you put all these clamps on there with a good call in there, keeping it all flat, then you can do a real good job of squeezing that glue out of there. The thinner the glue joint, the stronger the glue joint is pretty much the rule of thumb. A fat glue joint really doesn't hold anything. Okay, that's pretty clean. Now I'll get a clean towel and some water and wipe that up. I'll first just take a dry towel and go over it and try to clean it up a little bit with a dry towel and now I'll get some water on that. And now I'll dry up the water and that should be good to go. And we'll let that set at least 24 hours if not longer. Well, another day or so has gone by here on the project, and you can see that I do have the clamps off. The bridge is in real good shape. I guess the first thing I'm going to do is run a drill through here and open this back up. So next I've gotten in the habit of running this reamer through here and down to where it touches my finger. That makes all of the pins work so much better. It doesn't take that much. As Soon as I feel it touch my finger, I take it out. There you go, that's all there is to it. That make that work so much better. All right, I'm gonna clean out the insides. Okay, I shook all the dirt and dust out of the inside there, and now I'm gonna level and recrown these frets. First of all, I always like to go lightly on here and feel where I can feel, and I can feel a few bumps, like it's just bumping a little bit right there. You can just kind of feel them grab right there. It's grabbing. Anyway, we're going to just level all the frets and get them good and level. You notice I keep moving this thing you, because this is an arched. In fact, most fretboards are arched on guitars. So you keep this moving the whole time. You don't just stay in one place. I can't try to pretend I'm not. To be honest, I didn't know my friend was such a picker. He had these things wore down quite a bit. Either that or he's just been playing it for a very long time without a fret job. Like maybe since it was new. Anyway, um, it needed that really bad and so we've taken care of that. Now I'm going to recrown them all. Now 
Now, if you look at the uh, fingerboard there, you can see there's quite a bit of what my buddy Randy Schardiger calls uh, DNA on there. Uh, yeah, well, we're gonna get rid of most of that DNA. We're gonna do that with a single edge razor blade. These, by the way, are the 12 thousandths uh, razor blades, 12 thousandths thickness. Uh, they're available on my uh, website under the products I use. You can find a link to purchase them. Anyway, we're gonna clean this all up and it's gonna look totally different when we're finished. Actually, I just got ahead of myself there. No big deal. I'm gonna stop doing that and I'm gonna go back to the sandpaper first. I forgot to do that. I need to take the 800 sandpaper and re-round all these frets a little bit better. Polish them up a little bit. A necessary step whenever you're doing a fret job. And yeah, I know that some of the critics will say you have to go this way. This is a much faster way to do it. And in my opinion, it rounds them off better because you're going forwards and backwards. And then the final advantage is that <clears throat> you don't run the risk of lowering a particular fret by just sitting there sanding on one fret. You could lower that fret by a few thousands. This way you keep them all in the same level. You do it 10 times faster and it rounds them off way better. So there's really no disadvantage to doing this. Some people say, well, you'll leave grooves in the frets. It's 800 grit sandpaper, folks. You're not going to leave any grit, any grooves. Just take a look at the frets themselves and see how nice and smooth they are and how nice and rounded they look. That really does a great job. It's definitely worth doing. I'm gonna get a fresh razor blade. I wasn't real happy with the results I was getting with that razor blade anyway. It seemed to be a little bit scratchy. So I'll try a different one. And we'll go back over it again. Okay, now that I've got that all uh, smoothed out, just clean it off a little bit here. And then I'll go back through on every fret and scrape right against the fret because there's all kinds of junk that gets pushed up against the fret. And I want to clean it all out. I like to turn it around and go the opposite way. It's easier for me than to try to do it all from one side. Okay, so the next step is to drop a little bit of Be Good Oil. Again, a product that you can find on the products I use page of my website. We'll just wipe it down. It doesn't take very much. A few drops will do the whole thing up to and including the bridge. And so we'll just wipe the bridge down a little bit too. You don't need a lot. It, a little bit goes a long way. I like to go back and forth like this because this gets it under the frets better than going this way. You just kind of use a combination of everything. Now that you get it all spread out, then you just go right back and wipe it all right off. I think because this is a friend of mine's guitar, I'll go over to the buffing wheel and buff it out real nice for him. Well, my friends, I didn't do a lot of buffing. I just did a quick buff on it. But you know, I got to thinking about this. There's something here that uh, you should look at that I can help prove my case about humidifying guitars. 
I get in all, all kinds of arguments with folks about humidification that you should humidify. You should humidify. Well, I say you never humidify unless it's real extreme circumstances. The reason is the wood is dried down to 6% moisture content before they build the guitar. That is considered very dry. Not little dry, that's very dry. Okay? So from the point from that point on, most of the moisture change in your guitar is going to be sucking in moisture, not expelling it. Though it can get drier than 6%, I will admit to that. But my point is that when you swell them up, you crack the finish and you know it creates all kinds of problems. People think that they dry out and that's what causes the cracking. It's the exact opposite. It's that they draw moisture. The moisture causes the wood to swell and the finish has to crack because it can't expand. You want to know why I can prove that on this guitar? Look right up here. This is the only place the finish is cracked. What goes there? That's where your arm is, where all the humidity is, where you sweat. This finish is cracked all over right here. I don't know if you can see the cracks, but in this general area, the finish is cracked. Why would it be cracked there? Because of the humidity. That's the only place it's cracked. It's not cracked anywhere else. Believe what you want. I've got no reason to lie to you about it. I've seen it for 40 years. I know what causes guitars to crack. One additional thing I'm doing on this guitar, every time I turn this guitar over, some of these ferrules fall out, three of them specifically. So I've put a little bit of this canopy glue just a little bit around the uh, ferrule and then poke it back down in here. It's not a very intense glue in the sense that it's going to like melt finishes or anything like that. It's a soft glue, it's a water soluble glue and it will glue uh, plastic to wood and I believe it's going to glue these uh, metal ferrules back to the wood also. So that way they won't fall out every time you just turn the guitar over. And in addition, the uh, reason to glue them in there is that they don't rattle. If they're that loose that they fall out, then they could rattle and create some kind of a weird vibration in the guitar. There's only three of them that seem to be that loose because they've fallen out multiple times on me here just working on it on the bench. So those are the three that I put the glue on. I think we're ready to uh, build a saddle now and get the saddle made for this thing, so we'll do that next. I went ahead and CA glued this saddle back together that I can use it as the pattern since it did seem to be well matched to the guitar. I thought I'd show my process for making this saddle. Here's a piece of deer antler and you can see that it uh, is a pretty solid piece. Um, in fact this one's so nice I hesitate using it for a guitar saddle since they're so thin. This seems to be thick enough. This is like the secondary part out of the antler. This one seems to be thick enough. I could probably make a uh, mandolin saddle out of it, but I've already got it cut to length here, so I'm just going to go ahead and use it. The first thing I do is you, you're trying to make something flat and square out of something round and curved, so I'm just going to flatten off the one plane here. This plane is kind of in the same plane, so I'm going to flatten that area off. Now that I have a flat spot, I need to make a 90 degree angle to that so I can saw this flat spot out. So here's how I make the 90 degree angle. Well really that's all I need. I just need something to sit down flat on my t saw table and then I can run this along the fence. Okay, I have my fence installed on my bandsaw and I'm putting the two little squared points down on the table. Got the uh, flat area against the fence and I have allowed extra. This is not cutting it too tightly even though I think I may have it a little too tight still. I'm going to go ahead and open it up just a little bit. I'd rather sand it down to thickness than try to cut it to thickness. So I've opened it up just a little bit more so it's maybe twice as wide as this is. And now I'm going to saw that off.
we have a very nice, very solid piece of bone here, uh, antler. And so now I'm going to run it through my thickness sander to uh, get rid of these saw ripples. And we'll, you know, as soon as I get that perfectly smooth, then we'll turn it over and cut the rest of the smoothness off this side. Quite honestly, I got a little ahead of myself there and I forgot to set this to the optimum height. So I cut more off of this than I would have it normally done on the first pass. That's okay though, I'm still plenty thick. I'm at 125 thousandths and the original is really close to 100 thousandths. It's 98.5 there. Uh, on this end, it's 102. So I'm going to stop at about 105 and start seeing if it fits. This one did fit pretty snug in the uh, bridge as it is. All right, so um, I think before I even adjust it, I'm going to run it through here again for like what they call a spring pass. I said I was going to take it down to about 105 thousandths. That's 105 and a half. Let's see what this side measures. That one measures 100 and well, 104 and a half, 105 and a half also, right? It it's really hard to, to to know exactly, but that's about as accurate as you're going to get when you're you know doing something like this. This sander is incredibly accurate. So if uh, you want. To know how to get a sander like this, I sell plans on my website, www.rosastringworks.com. Under the shopping page, it's on the top line, and it's sander plans. And it gives very detailed uh, drawings and measurements on how to build one just like this. And if you don't have a metal lathe and a uh, milling machine, which most people don't, then it also gives you some suggestions on how you can build it with mostly off-the-shelf parts. The other option would be that you could always take the plans to a machine shop and have them make the parts you can't make. Well, that gets me really close to where I want to be, so now we're going to make the shape out of this. And that's the tricky part, is getting something square and flat out of something curved like that. You can see it just barely, barely fits. For me, the flat bandsaw table is a good air, a good way to mark this off. I guess for the first thing I'm going to do, uh, since we're dealing with something like this, is I'm just gonna draw a straight line on it and get me a good straight area. I'm just gonna make sure though that that straight line I'm about to draw is gonna allow me to get this on here. I don't think it's gonna be any problem. I'm just going to mark something about here and about here just to give myself some kind of a measurement there that I know I'll be able to fit the antler saddle on here as long as I don't go past that. And the first thing I'm going to do, of course, then is cut that straight line here on the bandsaw. So you can see there we have a straight line. Now I'm going to go over to the sander. I'm not going to film it, but I'm just going to go over to the sander and just touch this and get it good and flat and straight. Now for me, uh, the way I like to do, work with this, turn the bridge or the saddle the direction that I want facing forward. This is the piece on here I want facing forward. And this, this is the base side. This is the treble side. So I'll lay it on here like this. And then I'll just you know, square it up to the table here, up and down, and then I'll take my very fine mechanical pencil, and this is a, I think a 0.5 millimeter, something like that, and just draw it on here as accurately as I can. And now I'll cut that out just as accurately as I can, and then I'll sand it down to the, to the line.
Well, there I have it cut out to pretty close uh, dimensions. I'm going to go over to the sanders now and clean it up just a little bit. I use this sander just dedicated to give me the right angle on my saddle. So this is the base side, so I want to sand off the back edge on a bevel. And this is about a 12 degree or so. Well, presently I have it set for about 15 degrees. Okay, I took that off till the uh, line basically disappeared. I can still just see a hair of the line right there, but we should be good. I'm going to use the uh, drum sander, the oscillating drum sander for this. That's really about it. I might touch up the ends of these, but I'm going to first see how it uh, fits in the slot. It probably won't go in the slot because this is still a little bit thick. Okay, I've got the bevel on the back side here, and I'm going to try to put it in the slot. It, uh, it's not going to go in there. It's, I had a feeling it would be too big, and it is. It's too big pretty much all over. So I'm going to just take down just a tiny bit of this, and we'll try it again. Well, I tried to uh, fit this in there, and you can see it, it kind of wants to go there, but not so much on this end. And you can see this end just doesn't want to go in there. I think that's maybe some glue and stuff that's in there. I can see glue. So I'm going to just take and scrape this. Hopefully that will get rid of enough of it to let it go in here. Can't really say for sure yet. It's just about to go. I think it just needs a little more cleaning. And it's a little tight uh, in places anyway, like there's just some inconsistencies. So it seems like right about in here there's still a little bit of tightness. That seems pretty good. That's getting real close. I don't want to force it because you can crack it if you force it. You, you want it to be really snug tight but not have to force it down in there. We're just about there. I can see I'm going to have to round the ends of these off because these are actually set down in there a little bit, which I'm kind of glad of that actually. That'll keep it from uh, going one direction or the other. So I'm going to round this end off first and then round this end off because that way I'll know I get it just right. I don't want to round them both off yet until I see how it's fitting up. Well, I can see that this one fits in there just like a glove right now. This one's still just maybe a fraction long. And so I gotta round it off, and by the time I round it off, it may just be right. It's so close to going, it's impossible to explain. It's, it's, it's probably half the thickness of a hair from going. So I gotta pull it back out, and I'll just take, instead of trying to do that on a sander, which would be very inaccurate, I'll just do it right here and just very lightly touch the ends of this with this file. And if you're worried that I'm going to scratch the guitar, I'm on the pick guard number one and number two, I'm barely using any pressure at all. Turn it around and do the same thing to this end. I'm barely taking anything off. In, in fact, I probably didn't take enough off, but better to sneak up on it than go too far. That might work. It did, it worked perfectly. Look how tight that is. There's no gap on the ends. It looks like that thing grew in there, doesn't it? The only thing is that it, I need to take a little bit of the uh, curve off here. It's sticking up above the curve just a little bit, but that's minimal. It's always better to remove something than to try to replace it. So I'm just going to draw this on here, and I'll draw it on here. And then I'll just go over to my little uh, drum sander and just work on that on the ends there. And should be able to get it right off without any problem. You can see there, there's the mark and there's the mark. 
Okay, that should make it fit perfect. I would think. Yep, that's perfect. That's just perfect right there. Can't do no better than perfect, so we'll call that good enough. Now we're gonna get the strings on this baby and see where the action is. My friend provided his own strings. These are Elixir lights. I've said before, I'm not a huge fan of the Elixirs. They're, I don't think they're bad. I just think they sound a little bit dead on day one, but they hold their sound for a much longer period of time. So they sound about as good after a couple of months as they do on day one. So that's, you know, okay. It's just not my favorite sound. I prefer the phosphor bronze sound. These pins are going in kind of tight, even though I opened up the holes more than they've ever been opened up. I noticed they were really tight when I took them out. They're very tight, I think. Way tighter than they need to be. I think part of the problem is that the string is, the button is still trying to push on the end of this. Even though these are beveled a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and bevel them all a little bit more. Well, hopefully that beveling will help a little bit. Um, I don't expect miracles here because these are giant pins. These pins are a lot bigger than your average. But I think that did work. I think that helped. I think for speed concerns, I'm just gonna put all these in down here first. I like to keep pulling up on it until the pin doesn't raise up anymore. You know, you keep doing that. That way that pin will stay down in there after you get your tension on your guitar. Like I said, these are not my favorite pins. These are these pins don't really have a taper to them. If you look at them, you can see they're pretty much the same size all the way down. And I'm not a fan of that. I prefer the tapered pin, but but on the other hand, they're working and we'll make it work. Okay, all the strings are locked in place. Now I'll show you my technique. I've shown this many times before. Pull your string up tight, the bass string, and you wrap it around your peg. It's as tight as you can get it. You wrap it around and you go above the previous wraps. You stay above it until you get around a one and a half or, or, or two or so. And then you go back through the hole and you stay above the strings you've already wrapped. You pull it up tight, lift it straight up, and clip it right off at the top of the post. It'll never go anywhere, and you're already basically tight. You don't need a string winder. It's the fastest way you can put strings on. It's got all the positives. It keeps the string winding down the post, which is what you want. You never want them winding up the post toward the top. It's also the fastest and easiest way. So whenever it's fast and easy, yet it also has the most benefits, it's the way to do it. Now I could do the very same thing on the other side, but I don't. I, I use a different method for the treble side just because the strings are so small. For the other side, what I do is I just poke it through from the inside going out I pull it up to where there's just a little bit of slack, about this much slack as you can see. I wrap back around under the string, like so, and I'm going under it there. And you, The trick is you go around the end of there and you go under and then you pull it up tight and then you lift it up so that it's now locked in around this string here. Now you can tighten this up. Now this you... You can use a string winder because this will take a few more turns, but it doesn't take a lot of turns. And it keeps everything very consistent. And then you cut it off at the top of your post just like the other side. Just for the record, you can use the same method on this side that I used over on the base side. The difference is you have to wrap more times around just to be sure that it doesn't slip. Okay, we'll tune her up and then show you what it looks like. 
Okay, I'm checking the action. The action on this is crazy low. It's like 55, 60, somewhere in there. And about 65 to 70 there, which is crazy low. The action up here, I can tell just by looking, is good enough. It, you know, I don't know exactly where it's at, but it's, it's definitely low enough. I can tell that. So let's just make sure. Yep, just about, just about perfect, really. Well, this E and this B could technically go down just a hair, but they're pretty low. I think I will go ahead and do the, the E for sure, take it down just a little bit. I think I'm going to leave that good and well enough alone there so I don't end up making a whole new nut for this thing. All right, we'll get it into final tune and we'll play it for you. Well, for a guitar that was refused by two Martin authorized factory repairmen, I was able to get this thing fixed in under two hours, including a complete fret job, fret leveling, fretboard, everything. And it plays perfectly. And it, even when, even when you get on it, it doesn't buzz, even though it's set incredibly low. So it's a nicely set up Martin guitar. I hope you enjoyed seeing how I did the uh, setup on this and how I made that antler saddle. If you did, be sure to give me a thumbs up. If you're not yet subscribed, well get that done because I'm trying to make it to 100,000 subscribers and you're holding me up. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.